So maybe, uh, so good morning in Korea and good evening in US. So we are very happy to have uh, Professor Tan Shibarat from Caltech. Uh, he has been really leader of the development of uh, quantum field theory and string theory, who's, which is still very strongly developing at the moment. And uh, uh, Professor Shibarat will talk about his personal view of early years of string theory. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to my friends in Korea. Uh, is this, should I shift to full screen mode? Or is this, does it make a difference if I do that? This is full screen for me. Is that, yeah, does that make any difference? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So let's get into it. So I've been invited to give a personal account of the early history of string theory. And I've decided to interpret this as being the period from 1968 to 1985. So after 1985, the subject began to receive widespread interest and acceptance, has remained very active ever since. However, I will say very little about that in this lecture. And since this will be a personal account of the work that I carried out with my collaborators, who are principally Andre Neveu, Joel Scher, Lars Brink, and Michael Green, uh, this is the work that I will primarily emphasize, although I will also mention things done by other people. So before 1968, uh, there, was, there was a program called the Analytic S Matrix. And string theory was developed out of this approach. So string theory was developed in the search for the theory of a, of a strong nuclear force. And the only force for which there was a satisfactory quantum theory in the 1960s was the electromagnetic force, which is, of course, described by quantum electrodynamics, or QED. This was, and still is, a well-established quantum field theory of electrons and photons. But that was the only quantum field theory that was understood at that time. And the goal of the high energy theory group in Berkeley, when I was a graduate student, in the 1960s, from 62 to 66, was to try to construct the S matrix that encodes the scattering amplitude of strongly interacting particles. So hadrons, as you probably know, is the name for particles such as protons and neutrons that experience the strong nuclear force. And the correct theory of hadrons, which is QCD or quantum chromodynamic, was formulated in 1973. It is a Yang-Mills theory of interacting quarks and gluons that is based on the gauge group SU3. Now, I feel it's, it's fortunate that QCD wasn't discovered a few years earlier. Had it been discovered a few years earlier, it is unlikely that string theory would have been developed, at least for a very long time. So th this point hasn't been emphasized previously, but I'm convinced that it is true. So the intellectual leaders of S-matrix theory research in Berkeley in the 1960s were Jeffrey Chu, who was my advisor, and Stanley Mandelstein. And Chu argued that quantum field theory could not describe the strong nuclear force. Perturbation theory would not be useful for strong interactions since the expansion parameter is large. Now this, of course, turned out to be wrong. QCD is a per gives you a perturbation expansion of the strong interactions and works very nicely. Uh, and, when, and there are regions where the expansion isn't so strong, the parameter. So instead, Chu proposed that one could deduce the hadronic S matrix from some general principles. And so the principles, uh, there were quite a few of them, and the principles started with unitarity and analyticity of the S matrix. Unitarity of the S matrix, uh, it, encodes the fact that probabilities should be non-negative or positive and add up to one, which is kind of obvious. And, and the, imposing the correct analyticity restrictions on the S matrix ensures causality. Another principle that is kind of surprising to people who hadn't seen it before is analyticity and angular momentum. Now, physical values of angular momentum, of course, are integers or half integers. Uh, and I always work in units where h bar and c are set equal to one. And, and, and Reggie realized uh, 
that it's sometimes useful to interpolate between these physical values and consider continuous values of angular momentum. So hadrons, especially the baryons, many of which were discovered in the 1960s, were observed to lie on approximately linear and parallel Rege trajectories. So you have a formula J equals alpha of S, which is a linear function in S. And whenever the function is a non-negative integer J or half integer in the case of fermions, there is a stable particle or an unstable resonance of spin J and mass M, where S in the formula will be take the value M squared. So in the case of hadrons, uh, the, just taking the experimental data, the observed Reg A slope uh, parameter alpha prime is approximately one GeV to the minus two. So it, let me just remind you of basic kinematics. In a reaction where particles one and two scatter to give particles three and four, and energy and momentum are conserved, so you have the four vectors, P mu, for the energy and momentum, and the Mandelstam variables, which are in or Lorentz invariant variables, are, are given by the formulas shown where you square these things using the Lorentz metric. And, and the sum S plus T plus U is the sum of the squares of the four masses. So there are two independent invariants. Variance. So that's, that's basic kinematics. Now, uh, the important principle was the bootstrap conjecture, which was introduced around 1960 by uh, Chu and Frouchy. And the idea here was that particle exchanges provide the forces that are responsible for the existence of the very same particles. So the, the poles in the T-channel shown here uh, represent exchange, par exchange particles in a reaction where the S channel is a physical channel. And, and, and the idea is that the forces caused by these exchanges are responsible for the existence of the resonances uh, given in, the, in this formula in terms of the expansion in S. Now, this is kind of a strange idea because it, it completely clashes with conventional quantum field theory. In conventional quantum field theory, one adds the contributions of Feynman diagrams containing poles in all channels. But in the bootstrap framework, that would be double counting because you'd be adding these poles to these poles, which you shouldn't do. So it so was a rather radical idea. Another important principle that uh, the one had in the S matrix program is what's called the narrow resonance approximation. And that's basically just neglecting the widths of resonances. So the exact pole positions for an unstable resonance are in the complex plane where you have a real part M and an imaginary part gamma. Uh, and, and if you go into technical details, it's actually on someone's second sheet of the Riemann surface. So the narrow resonance approximation corresponds to neglecting gamma and, and, uh, and that corresponds to the leading or tree approximation and a perturbative treatment of string theory, well, will be string theory. So the, the first really dramatic event was in 1968 when Veneziano just wrote down an explicit formula. And he gave an explicit realization of, of the principles of duality and Reggie behavior in the narrow resonance expansion or approximation. And a, a simplified version of his formula is the one shown here, where, where G just represents the coupling constant, and B is Euler's beta function, which is some ratio of gamma functions. I remind you that gamma functions have poles when the argument is zero or a negative integer. So th therefore, therefore, this function has uh, poles whenever uh, any of these alphas is a positive integer. Uh, so the Reg A trajectories are linear functions in this formula, are taken to be linear functions in this formula. And this formula satisfies the bootstrap equation. So that what that means is that you can expand A of S and T in terms of the poles either in the S channel or the T channel. The two expansions have different regions of convergence, but the two regions overlap, so you, they describe the same analytic function. Now, shortly after that, uh, after Veneziano's formula, Vera Zura 
propose another formula as an alternative, which has complete symmetry be the, between the three variables, S, T, and U, and is given by this expression here, a little more complicated ratio of gamma functions. And remarkably, these two guessed formulas just turned out to be almost precisely the tree approximation amplitude for open string and closed string scattering. So the Veneziano formula corresponds to the open string scattering and the Verizaro to closed string scattering. In the modern interpretation, these will correspond to gauge theory and gravity interactions, respectively. Now, very quickly, the n particle generalization of the Veneziano formula was found. It was founded in 1969. Remember, Veneziano's formula was 1968. And it was found by several groups. And, and, and they all got the same formula, although they may have used different notation. And uh, this is what it looks like schematically. I haven't shown you the measure or the use of n. But it contains step functions that ensure uh, this ordering of the y's. And it also contains delta functions such that there are only n minus 3 independent integrations. By a change of variables, this a sub n can be brought to a form in which the n particles are attached to points on the boundary of a circular disk instead of uh, on an infinite line as they are in this description here. And uh, when you put them on the circular disk, you can see that the important thing is the cyclic ordering around the circle. And the particles in the previous formula are required to belong to the adjoint representation of a gauge group, such as SON or SPN. And the complete tree approximation amplitude is then given by a sum of these A sub n with coefficients which code the group theory uh, dependence. And they're given by some traces of products of matrices that are called chan Payton factors. I won't go into the details. And she, Right at, very soon after that, Shapiro gave an n particle generalization of the Virazoro formula. And it's an analogous formula, but instead of n minus 3 real integrations, it has n minus 3 complex integrations. And, and this formula has total symmetry in the n particles, not just cyclic symmetry. And there is no associated gauge symmetry group. It can be recast in terms of endpoints on the surface of a two dimensional sphere. In 1969, uh, so the same year that these amplitudes were written down, Fubini and Veneziano showed that these formulas have a consistent factorizations on a well-defined spectrum of single particle states, which can be described by an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, do with the usual kind of algebra, a dagger commuted with a is one, et cetera. And so you have an infinite collection of oscillators where you have an index m, which runs from 1 to infinity, and mu, which runs over the indices for space and time. Uh, so there's one set of such oscillators in the Veneziano case and two sets in the shapiro Verizaro case. So you have an enormous spectrum of states given by, by the Fox space generated by all these oscillators. The fact that there is a consistent factorization for a well-defined spectrum of particles was the first indication that one is dealing with a theory and not just an intriguing collection of formulas. And the following year, 1970, Nambu, Nielsen, and Susskind independently interpreted the spectrum and amplitude as arising from the theory of a relativistic string. Open strings with ends in the Veneziano case and closed strings are looped in the shapiro Verizaro case. Remarkably, the formulas for the amplitude preceded the interpretation. Uh, they didn't all use the name string, but, uh, but they all had the same concept. So the string tension is re related to this parameter alpha prime, which is the slope of the Regis trajectories, and, and, uh, and the tension, which has dimensions of mass squared, uh, in units for h bar and c are set equal to one, uh, uh, is related to alpha prime in this way. Now these strings sweep out two dimensional world sheets in space time. And open string amplitudes can be expressed as integrals of n particles attached to the boundary of a world sheet that is a disk as mentioned previously. 
And the closed string integrals can be recast as integrals of n particles attached to the surface of a world sheet that is a two-dimensional sphere. And there is no order in, in that case. So having found the spectrum and tree approximation amplitude, it became possible to study radiative corrections or loop amplitude. And these are given by integrals associated to higher genus Riemann surfaces. The Riemann surfaces I've talked about so far are just the disk and the sphere, but they're things with handles and can get very complicated. So after graduating from Berkeley, I was junior faculty in Princeton for six years. And I followed the developments I've described so far with great interest. Wrote a couple of insignificant papers, but my first significant contribution was a 1970 paper co-authored with David Gross, Andre Neveu, and Joel Shirk. So, so in the G paper that we wrote, we studied open string one loop amplitudes. And the relevant world sheet is topologically a cylinder with two circular boundaries. And there were two cases of interest that we considered. In the first case, all four scattered particles are attached to one of the boundaries. And in the second case, two of them are attached to each boundary. So in, in, for example, particles one and two are attached to one boundary, boundary and particles three and four are attached to the other one. In the first case, the, 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 amplitude, the one loop amplitude has divergences, but these can be removed by, in a consistent manner by a procedure previously described by Neveu and Schirk, so that was okay. The second case in which there are two particles on each boundary turned out to be much more profound. We found that the amplitude contains unexpected branch points in the coordinate S equals P1 plus P2 squared. And these, the existence of these branch points violates unitarity. So unless one could eliminate them, there would not be a consistent theory. The whole program would be dead. So all all that proceeded would go down the drain. So this was a really serious problem at the time. But it was solved the following year by Claude Lovelace, who was at CERN at the time. And he rescued the theory by observing that these singularities would become poles rather than branch points, provided that the reg intercept alpha zero is takes the value one, and the dimension of space time is 26. Now, this was really shocking because none of us had questioned Z equal four ever before this. Uh, it, I didn't even say that Z was four in any up till now because it was obvious. We all know Z is four. Uh, but Lovelace's discovery forced us to take extra dimensions of space seriously for the first time. And in this case, 22 extra dimensions of space, which seems utterly crazy. So why should hadrons require extra dimensions? And why should the spectrum contain a massless spin one particle, which is what the alpha zero equal one implies? Uh, these are not features we expected of hadrons, and so th this was quite puzzling. The new poles describe the closed string intermediate states in the reaction one plus two goes to three plus four. So, uh, so the cylinder can be viewed two different ways. It can be viewed either as a loop of open string or, the pro or looking at it in the other direction as the propagation of a closed string. And this was the discovery of open string, closed string duality. Because what is a one loop amplitude for an open string is, is just a uh, tree amplitude from the closed string viewpoint. But that only works if alpha zero and d equal 26. Uh, in the, and that's what we call this critical string theory. And in this special case, there is an infinite algebra of gauge symmetries described by what's called the Virozoro algebra. And these generate the group of conformal symmetries of the two-dimensional string world sheet. So in two dimensions, the conformal group is infinite and, this, and it's generated by this kind of an algebra. This is the, you can ignore this anomaly term if you wish. It's important that the physical spectrum described by all the oscillators subject to the Virozoa constraint not contain any negative norm states. This is an issue because the oscillators had an index mu, which is space-time dimension index. And when mu is zero, that corresponds to the time direction. And A zeros give you negative norm states. So, but the Virozoa constraints eliminate a lot of states from the spectrum. So if everything works out right, 
then what you would be left with are only positive normal states. And, but this needed proof, and it was far from obvious. And two different proofs of the, what's called the no-ghost theorem were given for the critical D equal 26 string uh, by Brouwer and by Goddard and Thorne in 1972. A consequence of the conformal symmetry of the world sheet theory is that the physical excitations of the string are only in the 24 transverse directions to the string. In January 1971, Pierre Ramon introduced a string theory analog of the Dirac equation. His proposal was just as that just as the string's momentum P nu is the zero mode of a string density P mu of sigma, that the Dirac matrices gamma mu should be the zero mode to some densities gamma mu of sigma. And so he defined, so, so, he, so he took gamma dot P with the capital gammas and Ps and looked at the Fourier components of it and called them F sub N. And if you look at F sub zero in particular, the, it'll contain the usual gamma dot P term that appears in the Dirac equation, plus a bunch of contributions for the other modes, which are given by various oscillators. Bosonic oscillators for the uh, P part and fermionic oscillators for the gamma part. Uh, so Pierre then proposed a wave equation, which is the natural analog of the Dirac equation in this setting, uh, which just takes this form. So I call this the dirac Ramond equation. Ramon also observed that the Virazoro algebra of the bosonic string generalizes to a super Virazoro algebra with odd elements, Fn, and even elements, the previous Lns. So this was one of the first super algebras in the literature. In March of 71, just two months after Pierre's work, Andre Neveu and I introduced a second interacting bosonic string theory. It has a similar structure to Ramon's theory, but the periodic density, gamma mu of sigma, is replaced by an anti-periodic one, h mu of sigma. And so when you take the Fourier components, the components are, or have to belong to half integers, integer plus a half. And, and so we call those things g sub r. And these g sub r's together with the ln's give us a very similar type of super Verazor algebra to the one that, you, that Ramon had found. Together with Charles Thorne, uh, Neve and I showed that the that the that the that the, that the bos this is the bos this structure gave us a bosonic theory, and so that showed that we could combine our bosonic theory remote with Ramon's fermions to get a unified theory of bosons and fermions. So what Ramon had done and what Andre and I had done were not two different theories, but two different parts of the same theory. And so this was an early version of superstring theory. And I showed that the space-time dimension of the critical RNS string is, is 10. So what had been 26 for the Veneziano theory turned into 10 uh, for this RNS theory. And again, there's a no-ghost theorem uh, that, that is satisfied in this critical dimension. My attitude at the time was that going from 26 to 10 was a st big step in the right direction and maybe the next theory we find would have D equal four, but that's not how the history worked out. Later in 1971, Gervais and Sakita constructed uh, a world sheet action for the RNS string, which is just a free theory with free, bo free boson degrees of freedom given by the coordinates X mu, and then uh, a, a Dirac type term for, for fermionic coordinates, with again with a space time Lorentz index. And they observed that this free theory has two dimensional supersymmetry. And this was remarkable because it was the first supersymmetric theory ever written down, or at least that was identified to be possible. Somebody wrote down a supersymmetric theory and didn't know it. But this is the first case where somebody wrote down a theory and knew it was supersymmetric. So, this result motivated Wes and Zumino to construct four-dimensional interacting analogs in 1973-74. And, and you probably know their work was very influential. It inspired the construction of possible supersymmetric extensions of the standard model and subsequent experimental searches. So 
So string theory has had an influence on experiments <laughs> through this route. Okay. So in 1972, Murray Gilman offered me a senior research position at Caltech. And this was very fortunate because the job market had collapsed at that time. Uh, the title of my position was research associate. Didn't sound very fancy, but the same position is currently called research professor, which sounds much better. I've remained at Caltech ever since, receiving a professorship in 1985 and retiring in 2015. And I still have an office and try to do a little research. Back to my story. So the success of QCD eliminated the need to formulate a theory of hadrons based on strings. It killed Chu's program. String theory as a theory of hadrons had problems. An unrealistic dimension of space, 25 or 9, and the presence of tachyons, which are mass squared negative, and massless particles, none, none of which are properties of hadrons. Other exciting developments in 1973-74 included the completion and acceptance of the standard model, as well as grand unification. So understandably, string theory, which had involved several hundred people around the world, uh, rapidly fell out of favor. But it wasn't completely dead. In 1973, Yonea in Japan interpreted the massless spin two state in the closed string spectrum as a graviton. With this identification and invoking a theorem of Weinberg, it was easy to show that string theory agrees with general relativity and low energies compared to the string scale. Similarly, the massless spin one states in the open string spectrum could be interpreted as gauge theory particles. This had been shown in 1971 by Nipper and Scher. In 1974, Shirk and I proposed to interpret string theory as a quantum theory of gravity unified with gauge theory forces, a potential so-called theory of everything, rather than as a theory of hadrons. This required that the string length scale should be roughly the Planck scale, which is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, rather than the nuclear scale, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So this change in viewpoint shrunk our strings by 20 orders of magnitude, which is rather dramatic, but the math was largely unaltered. We were unaware of Yonea's prior work, but we were proposing much more than he had. At, at this time, I knew what I would be doing for the rest of my career. And that turned out to be true. Uh, so th this proposal had several obvious advantages. The existence of gravity is predicted by the theory String theory has no UV divergences. In a gravitational theory, extra dimensions could be a good thing because the geometry of space-time is determined by the dynamics of the theory and it was plausible that there would be solutions in which the extra dimensions curl up and are unobservable. The 4D effective theory is determined by the details of the geometry of the compact extra dimension. The unification of gravity with forces described by yang mills theory is automatic in this framework. So how was our proposal received? Joelle and I spoke about our ideas at various conferences and seminars. Most people were polite and showed interest. I have a few important scientists, such as Gilman and Zumino, stated that our proposal was potentially very important. Yet our work was largely ignored. So why was that? I believe the answer lies in the sociology of the profession at the time. Relativists who thought about black holes, the geometry of the universe, et cetera, had no use for quantum theory. It was far removed from anything of interest to them. Particle theorists who were interested in understanding phenomena that could be observed in current or future accelerators had no interest in gravity. There was a lot of interest in supersymmetry, but not in gravity. It was far removed from anything of interest to them. So both groups of scientists were correct in their opinions, of course. Therefore, the two communities were completely disjoint. A proposal that would bridge the gap had no takers. It took a decade for this to change, but when it did, it happened very suddenly. Supergravity is a supersymmetric extension of general relativity. 
It was formulated in 1976 by Friedman, Van Uyven, and Heisenberg Ferrara. And their breakthrough paper was followed soon thereafter by one by Deser and Zumino, which introduced a clever way to simplify some of the calculations. The supergravity work was very important. I realized right away that I needed to understand it. In 1976, Agliazzi, Shirk, and Olive proposed a slight change on the, uh, a better way of understanding the RNS string. They proposed a projection of the spectrum, both for bosons and fermions, which is called the GSO projection, that removes roughly half of the states from the spectrum, including the tachyon. They showed that after the projection, the number of bosons and fermions is equal at every mass level. This was compelling evidence for 10-dimensional space-time supersymmetry of the GSO projected theory, but it was not a proof. Supersymmetry is necessary for consistency, in fact, because the spectrum contains a massless gravitino. And if the supersymmetry were broken, the gravitino wouldn't be massless. The 10-dimensional space-time supersymmetry proposed by DSO in 1976 is distinct from the two-dimensional world heat supersymmetry identified by Gervais and Sakita in 1971. They're completely different things. The GSO projection is required for consistency. Then the theory has supersymmetry in 10-dimensional Minkowski spacetime. This symmetry can be spontaneously broken when the extra dimensions are compacted. Also in 1976, Brink, Shirk, and I constructed supersymmetric Yang Mills theories in 10 dimensions. Uh, and in 10 dimensions, the spinner supercharge uh, has 16 components. By a method called dimensional reduction, we also constructed the Lagrangian for n equal four super Yang Mills theory in four dimensional space time, which turns out to be a conformally invariant quantum field theory. Exactly. It has four four-component Poincaré supercharges and four four-component conformal supercharges. In 1978, Cremer, Julia, and Scherk constructed 11-dimensional supergravity theory. It contains three fields. In addition to graviton and gravitino fields, it contains a three-form tensor field. 11D supergravity is very beautiful but it obviously has severe UV divergences. So a good question was whether it might be the low energy approximation to a, to a consistent quantum theory. And this question was answered in the affirmative in 1995, and the uh, theory is called M theory. In 1979, Michael Green and I began a, collabor a collaboration with the initial goal of understanding the 10 dimensional spacetime supersymmetry of the GSO projected RNS string theory. Whenever possible, we also collaborated with Lars Brink. Our work was carried out mostly at Caltech, but also at Queen Mary College London and at the Aspen Center for Physics. Joel Spirk tragically died in May 1980. Otherwise, he undoubtedly would have been a major contributor as well. So what did we do? Green and I formulated and named the type one, type two A, and type two B superstring theories. We proved the 10 dimensional space-time supersymmetry of the spectrum and interactions in each case. We computed various tree and one loop amplitudes and elucidated their properties. We formulated superstring field theory in the light cone gauge for the type one and type two B theories. We formulated an alternative world sheet theory that has manifest 10-dimensional space-time supersymmetry instead of the other formulation where you had a two-dimensional supersymmetry. In 1983, I wrote a paper that constructed the equations of motion for the type 2b superstring in the low-energy supergravity approximation. In a footnote, I pointed out that the equations of motion have a solution describing a 10-dimensional geometry of the form of five-dimensional anti de Sitter space times a five-dimensional sphere. It is analogous to the ADS-4 times S7 solution of 11-dimensional supergravity 
discovered by Freund and Rubin in 1980, three years earlier. These two geometries, ADS4 times S7 and ADS5 times S5, feature in the famous 1997 holographic duality or ADS-CFT paper of Maldacena. His primary example is the duality between the ADS5 times S5 solution of type 2b superstring theory and the n equal 4, 4d super yang mills theory, both of which have a supergroup symmetry called TSU 2 comma 2 slash 4. In the past 25 years, many results supporting the duality have been found. And there's no question but that it's correct, and, but the more and more details are being understood as the years go by. I am pleased to have been partly responsible for constructing the theories on both sides of the duality, but I'm also a bit embarrassed that I failed to notice the similarities between them. Anomalies. It is essential for the consistency of a quantum theory that local symmetries, such as gauge symmetries and local Lorentz invariants of the tree level or classical theory are not broken by quantum corrections. Such symmetry destroying quantum corrections are called anomalies and they potentially occur at the one loop level in parity violating theories. The standard model is an excellent example of a theory in which various such anomalies beautiful can beautifully cancel. If one ignores the quarks or the leptons, the quantum theory would be inconsistent. But when both are included, however, their anomaly contributions cancel. So, so that's a nice example of anomaly cancellation. We knew three superstring theories in 1984, type 1, 2a, and 2b, and two more would be discovered the following year. The type 2a theory is parity conserving, and therefore it is anomaly free. However, the real world is parity violating, so it cannot be realistic. The type 2b theory is parity violating. In 1983, Alvarez Gomez and Witten proved that all of its local gravitational anomalies cancel. And recently, very recently, more subtle potential anomalies have also been shown to cancel. However, in 1983, it was unclear how one can get anything potentially realistic out of the type 2b theory. That would change in 1996, when Vasa introduced a non-perturbative approach that he named F-theory. And in fact, in my view, that is the most promising approach to phenomenology based on Vasa's suggestion. For these reasons, Michael and I focused our attention on the type 1 superstring theory. Classically, it is a parity violating theory that is defined for any orthogonal or symplectic gauge group. There are two world sheet topologies that contribute to the anomalies, a cylinder and a Mebius strip. And each of them contributes anomalies, but with different coefficients. And we found that the two contributions only cancel if the gauge group is SO32. So none of the symplectic groups work and only one of the orthogonal groups works, SO32. Any other choice is inconsistent at the quantum level. We confirm this result by an analysis of the low energy effective theory, field theory. And in this setting, we could also analyze gravitational and mixed anomalies and it all worked beautifully for SO32. To our surprise, we also discovered that the anomalies could cancel for a second group, namely E8 times E8. I remind you that E8 is the largest of the exceptional Lie algebras. That's 248 generators. Both of these groups are 496 dimensional, both SO32 and E8 times E8, and have rank equal to 16. Also, they are associated to the two even self-dual lattices that exist in 16 dimensions. So uh, they, they have a lot of commonalities. We did not know a superstring theory with gauge group E8 times E8, but it was plausible that one should exist and we set out to find it. Within a few months, Gross, Harvey, Martinek, and Rome uh, the, uh, introduced the heterotic string for both gauge groups. I believe that Michael and I would have found this result eventually, but they beat us to it. Shortly thereafter, 
Candelis, Horowitz, Strominger, and Witten introduced Kalabi-Yau compactification of the six stretch extra dimension. So Kalabi and Yau are two mathematicians who looked at various possible higher dimensional manifolds. And this, these particular kinds of manifolds uh, showed particular promise uh, for, 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 for the extra, six extra dimensions. And applied to the E8 times E8 heterotic strength theory, they showed that this uh, compactification could give rise to four-dimensional effective theories with many realistic features. And, uh, and I add parenthetically, and also some unrealistic ones. In those days, one emphasized the realistic features. Nowadays, one more, it tends more to emphasize the unrealistic ones as our standards improve. So I'm ready to conclude and leave some time for questions. So the history of string theory is one of unification of particles and forces, of particle theorists and relativists, of math and physics, and it's been an exciting journey that is still going strong. There are several examples of lucky experimental discoveries. String theory is a rather rare example of a lucky discovery in theoretical theory. Witten has described the string theory as physics of the 21st century that happened to be discovered in the 20th century, which actually makes a lot of sense. A great deal has happened since 1984, a period of almost 40 years. In the mid 90s, a period sometimes referred to as the second superstring revolution, many additional important results were discovered, various dualities, M theory, which I alluded to, black hole entropy calculations, F theory, which I alluded to, et cetera. Also, as mentioned earlier, the ADS-CFT holographic duality discovery in 1997 was transformative. Other interesting current research directions include new types of symmetries, the Swampland program, and a program called celestial holography. An obvious question is where is the experimental evidence? Before the LHC turned on, there was optimism about discovering supersymmetry, but so far that has not happened. Its discovery would not prove string theory, but it would be extremely informative, leading eventually to a new standard model. Such a theory could make a better target for touch top-down approaches, which is what string theory really is. Uh, it would make a better target for it to aim for. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, so is there any question from audience? So <clears throat> I mean, you... I, I have, okay. I have very some naive and maybe some stupid stupidly sounded. Uh, so from the scattering amplitude, I mean, from the S matrix only. So is there any clue how to realize that really comes from string? I mean, if, if, when we know I mean string, then we can calculate then then we we have the same formula then, but from the formulation itself only, how can, I mean, Venetiano or some other expert notice, realize that would come from string at the time? Yes. So, so why, why did Nambu, Nielsen, and Susskind all simultaneously realize that these formulas were describing a one-dimensional extended object? Uh, yeah, and the the, sh the short answer is that the um, spectrum of excitations matches beautifully with the excitations of uh, that you get just by harmonic oscillate harmonic uh, motion of a of a string. So so the uh, uh, so the mo the mode if you if you okay. So if you think of the 
coordinates x mu of sigma, where sigma is the parameter along the string, the Fourier analysis in sigma gives you an infinite set of modes, and those modes all describe different mo excitation modes uh, of this object. And so the excitation spectrum that is built into those formulas just agrees with what you would get from the excitations, transverse excitations of a one-dimensional object, just from a mode analysis. Okay? I see. So basically, the red wedge trajectory solution was the most, I mean, clue, the biggest clue for the string vibration. Um, well, the spectrum of the string does lie on an infinite sequence of parallel uh, wedge trajectories. Uh, and uh, which, which are linear in the tree approximation. Uh, so, so that so that structure was very, is a, is a feature of the excitations of a string, and so it, it was fortunate that it was one of the principles that people were thinking about prior to the recognition that we were dealing with the string. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Hello. Uh, Can I there... ask a question? Go ahead. Hi. My name is Hyunmin Lee. Uh, I'm working on particle physics. But particle physics. I'm a theory. Uh, so actually, I attend this um, amplitude workshop uh, at CERN in the last summer. I uh, I realized that there are some a lot of interest in at asymmetrics program. Uh, for generalizing the Veneziano amplitude, a kind of a, a bootstrap uh, method, I think. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about uh, this recent uh, development yes. of uh, this program? I think mm -hmm. uh, I realized that uh, even all, in early time, there was a uh, discussion on Kuhn amplitude. Mm -hmm. This is different from uh, Reggie uh, spectrum. Uh, realizing the same rigid behavior uh, mm -hmm. in the S matrix somehow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's at the current time, we think there are five super strength theories. I've described three of them, and the other two would be the two heterotic theories that Gross, Harvey, Martin, and Rome found for a total of five. And all five of those are supposed to be different limits of a single underlying theory related by duality. So in, in, in this picture, there's actually a unique theory, which is a very beautiful picture. Now, it is an excellent question to ask, is this the only theory possible for quantum gravity? Or could there be others? Nobody knows the answer. No, no good candidates for another one has been put forward. But these searches, which have, there have been quite a few papers written in the last couple of years, uh, following up on this earlier work of Kuhn that you mentioned, uh, that uh, have, have been investigating different what can happen if you give up certain of the assumptions that go into the formalism I described, and where, where does that lead to you? And this is an completely open question and nobody knows for sure what the outcome is going to be. But I am willing to bet that they're not going to find any new consistent theories. That'd be my guess. Mm -hmm. But I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. could be wrong. I see. Okay. But I'm willing to go on the record with that guess. Uh, the, if, they, if they do find something new, that would be very important. But uh, even though they may find things with many good features, it, there's a lot to gain. That can go wrong, mm -hmm. because the I think that they made some uh, small number of assumptions. Yes. The the, the yeah. they I mean, have the point of view. So yeah. the landscape of possible ideas is infinite, and and, and people are, are, there's 
been more exploration of that in the last couple of years than there had been in all previous years. And I think the work is of some interest, but uh, I told you my opinion as to where it's likely to end up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> because uh, there was a question on uniqueness of string theory in that context. So mm -hmm. it might be interesting. I don't know if it's interesting or it's uninteresting. <laughs> so, I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's worthwhile. Mm, okay, I see. Because as I said, I could be wrong. But uh, but I just I, but I'm willing to stick my neck out and say I don't think it's going to lead to any new theories. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I, I I got a question. Uh, so uh, well, uh, this is a rather general uh, uh, question uh, about. Uh, quantum gravity and uh, which is uh, certainly related to the string series and uh, and where we would like to construct and understand the uh, quantum gravity uh, uh, ultimately and and do you have uh, some prospect and, and uh, certain opinions about that uh, yeah it is true that there are other approaches to quantum gravity in the literature and uh, some communities who feel quite passionately passionately about the superiority of their own approaches uh, I have always been of the opinion I'm going to say something controversial but anyway I'll do it I've always been of the opinion that if they had any really good ideas, we would have found a way to implement them in string theory. But I haven't found anything that they've done that I would want to try to take advantage of. Okay. Any other questions? So, I mean, string theory has been um, by itself going very well, but on the other end, there are a lot of skepticism from outside. So what do you think of the future of the string theory or yeah. quantum field theory now that they are combined as a single theory? Right. So when, when the subject took off in 1985, and lots of people started working on it, there were a number of prominent physicists who were very outspoken in their dislike of it. And a, a prominent example would be Sheldon Glashow, for example. And none of these people pointed to some specific feature of string theory that they dislike. They just disliked the whole program. And uh, and frankly, I don't think any of them really attempted to understand it very well. Uh, so, so, so this negativity had a bad impact for young people who were trying to enter the field because some institutions were unwilling to hire people doing this sort of work. Uh, but over the years, that's died away. And by now, all reputable places have who are engaged in theoretical physics research, uh, uh, generally uh, have people who work in this area. So, uh, so I, so I, so I don't think that uh, that those uh, criticisms uh, had any lasting effect. They were just a, a, one feature of a transitional period. All right, so is there any other questions? Oh, before uh, closing, uh, I have one secret to reveal if you don't know. So Professor Kip Song came here for uh, some time ago for the movie Interstellar, and he gave a colloquium at Kias for 300 uh, keys and uh, college keys and high school keys and elementary school keys. And there's a long, like, third distance uh, question and answer. At the end of the one uh, question, so one kid asked him, 
what would you do if we are young again? And Professor Gibson said very quietly, string theory. Did he and, really? Yeah, so probably, probably oh, that's, not, interesting. that's interesting. Probably you see him then uh, probably he never told you guys second uh, name, you guys, but uh well, that was, yeah. Kip is a good friend, but uh uh I never tried to sound him out on what how he felt about string theory. And obviously he was doing different things. Yeah, of uh, course you got Nobel Prize yeah. now. Uh, I'm hoping that these observations of colliding black holes could give us some clues about quantum effects. Right. But I don't think that so far anyone has a really compelling idea of how that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, but, but I'm glad to hear that Kip feels the way you described. <laughs> yeah, so he was just uh, giving, I mean, he was obviously spilling his uh, childish wishes, and uh, we are all surprised uh, that uh, he says so. I don't know if I'm surprised or not, but I'm pleased. <laughs> all right. So is there any other questions from audience? Let me ask you very another very stupid question. Uh, I'm a condensed matter theorist, uh, so I cannot understand very well uh, most of your talk. But nevertheless, uh, you explained that string theory started from kind of phenomenology of uh, hadron hadron theory or hadron spectra. Yes. Then suddenly, uh, the string theory jump from a totally different length scale from Hadron physics to the Planck scale. Right. So, so just by mathematical analogy, but in physically, these two different worlds are really connected or not? Yeah, so the, um, it, so, it, so the string theory in its current version is supposed to ultimately describe all forces. Right. And uh, But the way you're going to find QCD starting from the current string theory is yeah. first you have to figure out the correct way to compactify the six extra dimensions. And, that, and, we, and that's really a wide open question about very fancy mathematics. Uh, and I think that we're very far from understanding in detail how to do that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, the kalabi yau manifolds I mentioned in the talk which are complicated enough, and that's pretty fancy math already. But what we're going to need, I think, which is appearing in F-theory, for example, is, is really very high-faluting algebraic geometry, which is way over my head. But a, a different, slightly different question you could have asked is is there a string theory of hadrons? Exactly, yes. Uh, and uh, which is a good question. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the answer is that so far we don't have a very good string theory of hadrons. There are some things that are, give some qualitatively correct results that are mm -hmm. not really fully consistent theories. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's apparently true is that if there is a string theory of hadrons, in other words, if, when I talk about a string theory of hadrons, what I mean is right. a theory that is equivalent to QCD. Exactly, yes. Okay, it would be, if, it, if it were to exist, it would be a theory that's equivalent to QCD. Yeah. Uh, and because that's the right theory. And uh, one feature that it apparently would need to have is that there would be at least one extra dimension, which is kind of surprising, but um, mm -hmm. it's not fully understood, but, the, but Polyakov has emphasized that fact in particular. Mm -hmm. But at, at best, uh, uh, the string theory for Hadron physics is kind of phenomenology, while we, we believe the microsp microscopic theory for hadron should be QCD. Yeah. 
I think so, this general opinion, mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. opinion. You know, if you have two different descriptions of the same theory, as you have in this ads CFT kind of duality, uh -huh. that, that's very powerful. Because what happens in the ads CFT duality is that when one, when one picture is weakly coupled, the other one is strongly coupled. I see. So, so by had, knowing the existence of this duality, you mm. learn features in either picture that you wouldn't, which wouldn't be obvious without the other picture. I see. So you don't have to take a string theory for Hadron as just a effective phenomenological theory. Yeah. So I mean, certainly you, you, people can write down phenomenological descriptions of hadrons that look kind of stringy. But if you want, if you want a real full-fledged theory uh -huh. um, that's equivalent to QCD, that doesn't currently exist. But and I don't know whether such a theory should exist or not. Uh -huh. But, but um, perhaps it should, but I'm not sure. I see. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so if there's no more question, then <clears throat> let's thank the Professor John Shivrat again. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also, All Professor right. Kimberly. All right. Good. This view, Samia. All right, John. Bye. Bye-bye.